Hey, check it out. I just bought this phone and what is that? Can you hear that? And it's the countdown until I'll need a new one. This phone is objectively better than phones from previous decades, like this one. It fits in my pocket. It works almost anywhere I go. It keeps me from getting lost. And when I'm bored, it entertains me. Oh boy, does it entertain me. I am not entertained! But it's also true that it'll last much, much less time than this old phone did. In fact, it's designed not to last because businesses around the world are doing their best to take as much of your money as they can, as often as they can. And did you know that there's a name for it? It's called planned obsolescence. And businesses use it as a strategy to make weaker and worse products and to put out so many versions that, well, your next device is already outdated by the time you open the box. But why? Or better question, how did we get to this? How did your phone, your TV, your car, maybe even your house become something that you almost immediately want to swap for something better? And is there anything you can do to fight it? It's time to think bigger. You know that we're gonna talk about phones, but did you know that planned obsolescence started over a hundred years before the first smartphone hit the market? If you saw the Veritasium video on the subject, you might be thinking light bulbs, but it actually started with bicycles. In the 1890s, bicycles were the hot ride. Everyone wanted one, everyone bought one, and bicycle companies, well, they wanted to sell even more. But how do you sell a product that everyone already owns? So the bike companies came up with a brilliant and diabolical idea, offering new models, a lot of them. This idea established many of the practices we see from car makers today, new features, new colors, and new models every year that pressured owners to trade in for the next big thing. In one of our videos, we talked about how the trolley system gave way to buses and cars, but bikes gave way to cars first. 30 years after the bicycle boom, General Motors honcho Alfred Sloan looked back at what the bike companies did and said, now there's an idea. Excellent. They made design changes every year that kept customers wanting a newer, better model of car. These practices, they're expensive. Research, engineers, prototyping, developing, and marketing, it all costs money. Smaller car companies couldn't keep up with this new, expensive method of constant innovation and re-engineering. Many went out of business, but for the bigger companies, it paid off as owners felt the pressure to trade in their car after two or three years to get a shiny new one. So where did we get the term planned obsolescence? It was coined during one of the 20th century's lowest points, the Great Depression. In the book, Ending the Depression Through Planned Obsolescence, author Bernard London suggested it as a strategy for economic recovery. Bernard also proposed making people pay a tax to keep old things. Hey, isn't that what we currently do with subscriptions? Thanks, Bernard. If planned obsolescence is everywhere today, and it is, what are some tactics they use to keep you buying? Let's look at the different ways companies use planned obsolescence to get our money. Experts break it down into three pillars. The first, frequent design changes. Look at college textbooks. With small edits each year that makes used books worthless and require that students buy new editions. Or Apple's parade of cables, which only stopped after the European Union stepped in to require the USB-C standard on portable electronics. Here, check this out. Yeah, I still have all these cords in my house. I might still need one again someday. The second type, termination or limiting of the supply of spare parts or documentation. Companies stop producing replacement parts so that older models can't be repaired, even well within their lifespans, or they limit information on how to repair. John Deere, the tractor maker, blocks access to software diagnostics, preventing owners and unauthorized companies from making repairs. There's a lot more to the John Deere story. We'll get to that in a minute. The third type of planned obsolescence, 
using non-durable materials. This is an interesting one. Did you know that light bulbs were deliberately nerfed? Mm -hmm. Light bulbs used to last a lot longer. In fact, a light bulb in California has been lit almost continuously since 1901, but that doesn't sell enough light bulbs. So in the 1920s, a cartel of companies, including General Electric, worked together to create new, shorter standards for light bulb duration. They not only established a 1,000 hour limit for how long light bulbs should burn, they agreed to pay fines if one of them actually created light bulbs that lasted longer. They called themselves the Phoebus Cartel. No, I promise that's not a joke. They literally call themselves that. The takeaways, if you're in something called a cartel, you may want to question your life choices. Someday, and that day may never come, I'll call upon you to do a service for me. There's nothing inherently bad about progress, about new features on our cars, for example. Backup cameras help to make driving around safer, but adding a backup camera to an older car is something the average driver can't or won't DIY. And cars are not designed to make these aftermarket installations easy. All of this has a huge price tag, but just how much does it cost us? We're paying for planned obsolescence in many ways. The most obvious, well, money. Starter homes are a marketing concept from the 1950s when home builders wanted to encourage owners to purchase multiple homes over their adult lifetimes. This is why your grandparents or great-grandparents may have stayed in the same house for decades, while younger family members feel pressured to buy bigger, better homes over time. And we mentioned John Deere, the tractor company, and how it blocks access to diagnostics to control who can repair their equipment. American farmers lose $3 billion in downtime and pay $1.2 billion in excess repair costs every year because they have to rely on authorized dealers for repair. Imagine owning a pair of jeans, and you could only combine it with a belt, shirt, and shoes from the same company. And if you tried to wear something else, the pants just stopped working because you voided the warranty. That could get really awkward. And it's not just about the right to repair. Across industries, companies cut corners in ways that pass the cost, financial or sometimes human, onto someone else. The electronics industry has a well-documented problem with forced and exploitative labor both in assembly and the extraction of essential elements like tin, tungsten, and gold. At the other end of the product life cycle, what actually happens to all our old stuff? E-waste or electronic waste is one of the fastest growing waste streams worldwide, and less than a quarter of it is recycled. The latest figures showed that about 62 million tons of e-waste is thrown out per year. The same year, 2022, estimates showed that 5 billion smartphones were turned into e-waste. And e-waste doesn't just take up room. It leaches toxic chemicals into the water and breaks down into microplastics. Where e-waste accumulates, children work alongside their parents to scavenge valuable components. It's a type of forced child labor considered among the worst by the International Labor Organization because of the outsized effects of toxic materials on children's bodies. And here's the gut punch. We keep creating this problem just to keep up. Because planned obsolescence is more than just physical, it's psychological. Companies want you to feel that what you just bought is already out of date. Uh, honey, did the mail come? I ordered a Switch 3, a PlayStation 6, the Brooks Ghost 19, and an iPhone 21. Oh, what was I saying? Oh, planned obsolescence. It can be hard to avoid, but not impossible. What exactly can we do about it? When it comes to planned obsolescence, you are not powerless. Human beings do what we do best, improvise. Under public pressure, some states are exploring or adopting right to repair laws for cars, phones, and more. The philosophy behind the right to repair is that you own the things that you buy, and you should have access to the tools, supplies, and documentation to repair them. The farmers who use John Deere equipment have been and are still fighting back using the court system in class action suits, claiming the company has an illegal monopoly by limiting repairs. The US Federal Trade Commission is suing the company on similar grounds. This is all ongoing, so this may be different by the time you see this video, but the important part is we are fighting back. Governments and groups like the European Union have also taken the lead on sustainability and consumer rights. 
not just mandating the USB-C standard for electronics, but also codifying the right to repair, mandating better performance for batteries and more. 3D printing has created new opportunities to source spare parts. When we can't get help from companies, people can help each other by sharing schematics through online communities. E-waste recycling has gotten more attention, and many communities are adopting responsible disposal practices. Getting rid of old electronics responsibly can mean dropping them off at big box stores, recycling centers, or in some cities, even leaving them on your doorstep for pickup. There's also, of course, buying less, or at least less frequently. At the individual level, that's something all of us can do right now. It may not be possible to stop the clock from ticking on your new appliances, TVs, or cars, but you can turn down the volume. Contact your state and U.S. representatives to support the right to repair. Check your city guidelines for how to dispose of e-waste. Research the repairability and durability of the things you buy. Repair what you can. Reduce what you can. Tell us below, did we miss an example of planned obsolescence that ticks you off? How are you making things you buy last longer? And like and subscribe to stay tuned for the next Think Bigger topic. Oh, well, maybe like this one. <laughs> so I'm looking at the camera then? Sure. Okay. Question your life choices. <laughs> Let me just go from the top. Now that makes sense and now I know what it means. Knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe!